organization. And so we are so excited to be able to welcome our very own board member, Yvonne Gallardo, coming in from California. <laughs> Thank you for, for making it out here. Um, so it's my pleasure to have this moment to introduce um, a, a formidable artist in the field. Uh, she's a NALAC Fund for the Arts grantee. Um, she's an international artist who comes um, in from Argentina via Miami. Uh, she's been working there for 10 years now. Um, Really a big fan of her work, multidisciplinary artist, has uh, won quite a few awards and has exhibited across the globe. And not only has she made work that is inspiring and aesthetically powerful, um, but it's also work that really reports back from the edges of social justice uh, reporting back from the edges of what it means to bring communities together and bring communities together in a way that really heightens an aesthetic experience at the same time. So I'm really happy to have this opportunity to introduce Agustina Woodgate, who's coming in from Florida to moderate the next panel. pleased and honored to moderate this panel uh, today we're going to be talking about art and social activism which I find an incredibly complicated topic <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I am very excited about this uh, conversation and how can we unpack uh, both the art and the activism and if there's a way to somewhat um, find a, a balance between them. So as the program suggests, um, we will be here with the four local cultural workers discussing strategies and practices for linking arts, culture, and social justice in a way that does not use the art as a tool, but actually as an integral practice for community building. So it is my pleasure to introduce Graciela Sanchez, and each of you, I will introduce them one by one, and they will do a little presentation on their way. Uh, Graciela uh, comes from Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. We are the survivors of physical and cultural genocide. Among the charred ruins of our communities, we search for remnants of the massacred. The conquest has left us empty. Los de poder nos hacen invisible, invisible, even to ourselves. To defeat us, to take our land, our language, to enslave and control us, they make us the ugly, the stupid, the lazy, the dangerous and violent. We are their greatest fear. Even less is said about the benefits gained from our crippled bodies and minds. In this condition, we serve them. We scrub their toilets, mop their floors, wash their clothes, prepare their food, cut their lawns, pick up their garbage, sing to their children, bathe their parents, pedicure their feet, and reassure them that racism 
is a thing of the past. Still, they only talk about the violence in our barrios and fill our neighborhood streets with cops and jails. I have been working at the Esperanza as a buena gente, a multi-issue social justice cultural center for over 30 years. It's gonna turn 30, but you help to organize it and plan it so you get a little more time there. Esperanza began by women of col color cultural workers, dykes of working class background. We work to change the culture of violence that has so devastated our homes, our communities, our cultures, sorry, and our world. Understanding the history of physical and cultural genocide, the Buena Gente of the Esperanza work to revive our communities, to restore connection among individuals and families, to re-educate ourselves and our young people, and to nurture our healthy, healthy lives despite the racist sexist, classist, trans, and homophobic violence that surrounds us. We do this through programming that speaks to our communities, that creates and builds a community of justice, compassion, cariño, respeto, y paz. With the theories of Gloria Saldua, Audre Lorde, Cherie Moraga, and many other queer women of color, in addition to our abuelitas, Doña Panchita, Doña Chavelita, we build the Esperanza. We have worked along with our community in organizing, concientizando nuestra comunidad to defeat anti-immigrant policies, to stop wars and the violence and torture in our ongoing neoliberal policies, and to stop the privatization of our water. With film screenings, we give first-hand accounts on the occupation of Palestine, or the ongoing effects of the North American Free Trade Agreement in this country, in Mexico, and China, throughout the world. We have hosted hundreds of platicas <coughs> with legendary shiros like Gloria Saldua, when no other cultural space or university would open their doors to such a genius. And other mujeres such as Dolores Huerta, Bar Barbara Smith, Betita Martinez, and Angela Davis have graced our community space. Susana Vaca and Lila Downs have offered free, well, we have, <laughs> we have programmed them for free concerts in the community. And we have also brought in elders like the rediscovered Tesoros de San Antonio. We have produced world premiere theater presentations of, for 20 and 30 year old queer voices such as Anel Flores' Empanada and Jesus Alonso's Joto del Barrio, Jotos del Barrio, while also supporting Dan Guerrero's Gaitino. We've proudly hosted the first AIDS and gay art exhibits in the state of Texas in the late 80s, when it wasn't cool to be queer, and gave voice to Ana Fernandez, Franco Mondini, and David Zamora Casas. And we continue to fight City Hall and local developers as they displace 300 individuals from their trailer homes or they continue to tear down a community in order to bring in the new folks who will teach us how to improve our lives and be prosperous. That's of course if we don't get gentrified out of the neighborhoods first. Yet as we do this and as we reach more and more people in our communities, we are attacked. They come after us. We have been threatened from every direction. We have struggled with allies as the men sought to divide us, mujeres, warned the women of Fuerza Unida to move away from the dikes, had, the, had us evicted because we pushed for a broader vision of social justice that was multiracial, multigenerational, with mujeres in positions of leadership, addressing multiple forms of oppression by race, gender, sexuality, disability, and age. Then right-wing Christians came after us with support from gay white male conservatives, had us defunded from all local arts funding. In the 29 years, our offices have been broken into, our computers have been stolen, our equipment destroyed, our windows broken, our lives threatened, human feces smeared on bras and hung over our cars and door entries, and daily, we can be assured that someone is writing negative stories about our work and vision or making sure that we once again don't get funded 
from, from some local foundation. Just received a letter a couple of days ago. We are working to change the culture of violence and greed and profit over people and asking each other to claim the values taught to us by our abuelitas of being buena gente and bien educado, of being honest and truthful, of taking care of one another, of respecting the elders, be they human, buildings, trees, or our madre tierra, of sharing our limited resources so that we all benefit, not just a few. And the work has to be a lifetime commitment. The work has to be of service to and for community. The work we do must be with a habit of self-examination and, and a commitment to justice. Si se calla el cantor, calla la vida. Muchas gracias. I would like to invite Maria Hernandez. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Maria Hernandez, and I am going to talk about myself. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the ways in which my role as a community member, as someone, um, I consider myself a community servant, my role in the community and how I connect art and activism. So first, um, I am a member and a co-founder of the Chicana Art Collective Mas Rudas. Matrivaz is um, <laughs> Matrivaz is made up of four of us: um, myself, Sarah Castillo, Ruth Buenteo, and Kristen Gamez. We started making work in 2009, um, specifically in response to the lack of representation of Chicanas in the art community. We would go out to exhibitions, mostly contemporary art exhibitions. And we were a little dismayed by the fact that we weren't represented in a city that is 65% Latino. So what we decided to do was respond in a way, in a visual way, through art. My role as an educator, which stems from my work at an organization not too far from here called San Anto Cultural Arts. Sananto Cultural Arts has two main programs. They have a mural program. They are the biggest contributor to public art in the city of San Antonio. And they also have a legendary newspaper called El Placazo. Thank you. I was the manager of El Placazo for three years and my community work and volunteer work with Sananto started in early 2000. So I feel like the education and the development that I got through Sananto Cultural Arts was extremely unique and has helped put me on a creative path. I definitely wouldn't be where I am today without their help. Um, while out Sananto Cultural Arts, I was a volunteer, I worked full time, and I ran a youth based program which opened up other doors for me in other youth based organizations throughout the city. My role as an artist um, entails supporting other artists. Recently, I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of the conflict that happened between Contemporary Art Month and the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. Um, that was a big deal for many of us, and I worked with uh, a good friend of mine, my fellow Ruda, Kristen Gamez, in order to respond in a positive, visual way to something that was a very sensitive subject for all of us, and we didn't know exactly how to articulate ourselves, so we thought we would respond visually. So in order to respond to a conflict that 
dealt with the exclusion or lack of representation of Latina artists in a very large um, art setting, we decided to hold our own show. Um, we talked to the Guadalupe Culture Art Center and they allowed us to host our show in the gallery, which is right across the street. That show, Novela, Arte and Drama, was an art exhibit featuring works inspired by the, no the telenovela and it was in direct response to the exclusion of Latina artists within Contemporary Art Month. And um, also within my personal work, um, I am an artist. While I do make work with Masrudas, I also make work on my own. And what I'm really interested in is, again, the lack of representation of people of color, Chicanas, Latinas, Latinx within the contemporary art field. Um, I have an interest in art history, and so this specific work and the work that I am currently created is in direct response to that lack of representation. This piece is now hanging in the Guadalupe Gallery. It is um, based on a historical art piece by Artemisio Gentilici, who was a Baroque painter in the early 1900s. Um, and what I have done is I have inserted myself into the story, into this art image, which is historical in a way to insert myself into that history. So through those different avenues, through those four different components, the work I do, um, I try to link art and activism. Thank you. Great Spare Parts is a volunteer organization and we're now raising funds to become a full-time effort in San Antonio. And it started with our materials giveaways at uh, our Fine Arts Fair. Um, our responsibility is to um, educate the public about reuse and not recycling through the arts. Teachers, nonprofits, and the creative community uh, on one day right before the beginning of the school year, come together and grab as many supplies and materials we've collected by businesses and individuals. Donors give pre-owned items, uh, nothing new is accepted. As a result, we divert tons of stuff from landfills. I founded Spare Parts because I was in a position to teach uh, a few years back, visual arts, but was given absolutely no money for supplies, right? We've been there. You're supposed to uh, have a job to accomplish and you don't have any resources for it. Um, so I started uh, looking for supplies and I met a uh, artist and teacher friendly business in town that sold, I'm sorry, that gave me and filled my car full of materials that they couldn't use anymore, scraps that they thought that were important to educators and artists, and they filled my car up and asked me to come back with the U-Haul. And at that point, I realized I could serve my community and um, arts community and uh, our educational community through being the connector between materials that we think sometimes can be discarded, but in the right hands can be very successful art lessons, art projects, 
um, and rich uh, curriculum lessons. You know, a lot of teachers spend their own money on supplies. Um, so what we do is educate the public about things like e-waste, and this is Karina, she's really excited about our e-waste, make, take it apart and make it art, make it art projects. Um, we get to engage with the public from youth to adults to challenge them to rethink the things around them because there really is no such thing as throwing things away. Um, and I refuse to uh, let the arts disappear from our community. Um, this is my, my mission and passion. We also have the Mini Art Museum, which is a portable museum. You know, museums were founded by white people to show off the shit that they uh, collected on their travels. And uh, we decided to, <laughs> it's true. So what we decided to do was make the fine arts experience take uh, control. Gabriela Santiago and I use uh, binders as the gallery walls, and we ask artists to create miniature artworks to, uh, for display in the mini art museum that's traveled all over the world. Um, and we get to take uh, control of the curatorial aspect and uh, allow others to view artwork. A lot of museums are not accessible to people, so that's another project we have. Um, that is what Spare Parts is about. And never forget that trash is a failure of the imagination. Thank you. And then lastly, I would like to um, introduce Diana Lopez. Um, so, our, our work is, is primarily based around workers. Um, my organization is called Southwest Workers Union, um, and we're a little bit different than most organizations because we started out as a workers union with school workers, cafeteria work workers, bus drivers, and custodians. But what we also realized in that process of talking about liberation <coughs> and human rights was that a lot of the workers lived in, in industrial areas, didn't have access to grocery stores, um, lived and, and were the objects of pollution and contamination, right? So then we, we started talking about environmental justice. And then we started talking about youth justice, right? And in the schools. Um, and, and ultimately our work revolves around um, the, the different areas that affect our workers and our members, right? We're, we're 3,000 members strong, which includes uh, teachers, uh, workers in the schools, youth, uh, residents, and kind of the list goes on and on, right? Because our, our community is developed of different people. Um, so a few years ago, uh, we started buying some land with, with some membership dues. So uh, an important piece of our work is, is sort of this context around owning land, right? Um, and this context, and, and historically, um, Chicanos, uh, black folks, um, anybody who was who had you know a, any type of color in their body was not able to own land, and, and in reality, were were the objects of violence, um, right? So, so it was important for us to have our own space that that we could create and develop it into what we wanted. So, um, zoom in to 2016. Um, our work is really around um, de developing a, a worker center community space. So we hold the Movement Gallery, um, which is sort of a space that is, is transformative. It used to be a barbershop for 50 years. Um, so in the sense of, of keeping that community space as, as, as a space of, you know, barbershops, you know, beauty salons is where you go get your cheese mint, you go meet, meet with family, right? Y'all know this. <laughs> Um, so, so we wanted it to, to keep that sense, and we also understood that, that a space need, needed to be transformed and informed by, by, by the community surrounding it. So right now, it's, it's home to, to Universidad Sin Fronteras, um, University Without Borders, which is a political um, emancipatory ed educational program, and I know there's, there's some students in the crowd right now and some coordinators. 
Um, so I'm, it's it's really sort of a space that, that transformed. Right now we're getting ready for May 1st International Workers Day, which is Sunday, um, which uh, part, part of this was, was really being a able to use um, and, and develop our workers as, as artists and sort of understand that there is no, no mi middle line between an artist and a worker, a student, right? It's, it's all meshed together, right? Our, our world, our world and, and this idea of, of categorizing people according to how you look, how you, your sexual orientation, you know, different pieces like, like, like that also works to, to divide our community and many times, um, we work to to decolonize minds, right? Decolonize the way we see each other and the way we work with, with, with each other. So so part of that art show is really being able to show the point of view of workers and, and in the sense, sort of the, the style of our organizing is is really able to, to be community led, community member led, um, and is informed by by the work that, that we do. So in talking about um, social justice and art, it's really um, something that, that is mixed. It's, there, is no, there is no divide, and, and what you see and what you feel um, is, is informed by, um, by, by, by the identity that, and, and by where you come from, by, by, how, by how you've been um, categorized. Um, and in, in the sense of our work and what we want to, to accomplish is really self-determination of our communities. It's, it's about speaking for yourself um, as a worker, as a student, as a co community resident, and to be able to then um, create um, the, the community that you would like to live in because oftentimes we see there's a disconnect between policy, there's a disconnect between um, the transformation of your community. Right now we're facing gentrification on the east side, we're, we're facing displacement. So, it, so in order for us to really be able to not be displaced and be stronger, we, we need to really look at the way um, we categorize, the way we, we view things in a sense of us being part of that decision-making process. Um, to be um, the architects of our community, the architects of policy, rather than the objects. Um, and. Um, that, that's kind of what I have to say, and I'm really excited to be here um, and having these, these, these conversations because we're, we're continuing to, to decolonize the way we, we, we view organizations, the way we view our communities, and this is a, a continuing struggle that um, we, we hope to keep having. And my time is up, and thank you. sort of formulating this eternal question between the relationship of art and activism. Um, personally, I am in a very similar uh, position um, in a way of the role that I occupy myself also in the community that I exist in this between one and the other. And this negotiation, I find it quite, um, quite challenging. So I would like to hear your your thoughts and somewhat discussed and unpack art 
but also activism. And if there is a way for an artist to be political or for a politician to be um, aestheticized, uh, which I think is where the complexity really begins. So, in very, um, you, you most of them somewhat touched on it, but I think that it would be good to hear what role art plays in your organizations. I mean, you uh, yourself are an artist, but you also run an organization, yes, and, and a collective. But, but I would like you to answer this question in, in the place of art, not necessarily of activism. <laughs> Um, I, I do work for a contemporary art museum called Blue Star Contemporary. I'm new to the museum and the reason why I took the job at Blue Star Contemporary um, was because I wanted to learn more about <coughs> contemporary art. I wanted to learn how the contemporary art operated and it's a form of education for myself. Um, and so I really feel like my work within the museum setting complements all of the other components of the work that I do. And um, it helps me maybe get an education that I would not be getting otherwise in terms of, I have a degree in English, I don't have an MFA, so it really is a way of educating myself on the role of art and contemporary art and how it is reflected within the city. So I, um, part of my, um, I, have a, I have two different lifestyles, <laughs> um, and part of the other part of my life is I'm part of a dance troupe called Zombie Bazaar Bansa Fusion. Uh, we recently won second place in the burlesque category for the current. <laughs> um, but, but part of the, the, the formation of that group was really be, being able to visually address um, so, social issues. Um, so a lot, a lot of the songs and a lot of the the the, the movement is based on sort of our identity. Is based on sort of the issues that, that are surrounding this. So so there's a lot of different um, songs and pieces that we dance to that that address violence uh, against women. That address. There's one on on Primero de Mayo, May first, um, and there's 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 a few others that that really um, talk about. Um, being queer, talk about being brown, talk about being proud, um, and, and really talk, talk about changing the system that, that we live in. And, and I think this, this emphasizes this need to, to all around have um, art and expression as part of our, our everyday work and our everyday lives. Um, and I think in, in the sense of, of the organization I work for, um, we've never called ourselves a, a, a cultural or organization, right? It wasn't until a few years ago that, that we were, were organizers, right? We go out into the community and mobilize folks and do, and do popular education, right? So, so, so the question of, of art and, and how do we integrate it was, was only a tool, right? And, and it wasn't until we needed to intentionally talk about weaving art and culture and community into social justice that we started actually building up um, our space as as a cultural um, community center um, and but it, it needed that intentional you know we now have have our organizer who's who's somewhere in the crowd um, Kimberly Rendon who's done really major strides towards towards weaving together these two aspects of, of our work and our you know 27 years of organizing workers um, and sort of this new challenge that, that we now bring each other with the space that we have and sort of this need to integrate it and to have um, more of a structured art-based um, type of organization. And um, yeah. Um, for spare parts, arts and community has a symbiotic relationship. Uh, much like uh, how many of you can easily go into your kitchen and make a great meal with what you have uh, without the recipe. Is anyone really good at that? So that's what we do, and almost like farm to table, uh, if you give us a project, uh, if we want to collaborate with you, we we source materials, we see what's in, in, in people's uh, garages, um, uh, closets, um, even, even going into recycled uh, warehouses and pulling stuff out before they're recycled to for reuse. 
So we collaborate with organizations and agencies that uh, want to engage in the arts, but we work with the materials that we have. So we, we kind of sometimes do the opposite of what other artists uh, do, which is I want to make a painting, therefore I need to go buy paint. Um, our goal is to work with a, a person, a group, and say what are your goals for um, the art program, the art project, the, the performance, and how can we create it in a sustainable way that causes that that has a very low carbon footprint and that is sustainable. And when we leave, it's very successful after working with them. Um, is that they're educated on um, what reuse is and sourcing materials and um, knowing that the materials that we're using um, are accessible to anybody and are are very inexpensive and usually free. So so community and art is is one in the same and because of that we make an environmental statement with our work um, i think again uh, for the esperanza um, we've always again seen the connection or the more we do the work the more we try to avoid this whole separation i think it's a u.s concept um, um, or a, a class sort of thing, so maybe US and Europe, as you were mentioning, or somebody was mentioning, <laughs> like the exhibits became, because you know I bought a piece and if I want the valley to go up, I'm gonna put it in the exhibit and then somebody's gonna uh, appraise it because it was in the exhibit and I'm gonna get the, I'm gonna hire the critic who's going to say that it's important and valuable and so the value goes up and, and it all becomes a capitalist, you know, consumer-based sort of reality rather than say the mujer who made this piece. You know, she's, she won't identify herself as an artist, but we would say yeah. a brilliant artist. But this person, you know, for me, when I wear these tomicotones and huipiles, it's also to remind myself of my people, uh, even though I've been separated from them because now I live here, but, um, this person probably got paid five dollars and whoever it's a birthday present so i don't know how much they uh paid for this but i know by the time it's been sold here you know it's been double triple quadrupled in price and that person still lives in poverty and the in-between people are probably just taking a lot of advantage of that but the colors are there because they have history and tradition um you know sometimes i think of the red as when I think of Guatemala and the Huipil is there and I think of the blood that has been spilled, you know, because of U.S. based wars that are taking place there because we want their land, because we want their resources and we'll do whatever, you know, to, to create that reality or maintain that reality for them. So, I mean, I think we just, it's hard to do this whole arts and cultural thing because I know as the, you know, when a gente of the Esperanza, also known for myself, uh, you know, being around there for the longest time, you know, when you have to sign for, to write a grant, they need an executive director, so we become executive directors, even though we don't like titles and we don't like hierarchies. Um, but we we sign that, and then I know from the community, it's like nobody wants to take on those roles as arts administrators because we're administrators; we stop being artists. But <laughs> You know, and then they say, well, you know, it's not as valuable. And so I like to also challenge and say, well, okay, but I'm gonna have to be an artist, I'm gonna be an installation artist because I put people together and ideas together and formulate those things. But it's, you know, but it's also, it, it's this whole thing about separating, you know, artists, activists, academics, and their hierarchies, and and it, it, it's, it's really defeating, I think, because we need to all be working together and, um, so I think we should challenge those notions, you know, and I think I've said it and I heard Diana say it earlier today. I mean, as we dress up, we're, we're being creative and we're defining, you know, we're all dressed totally different, but we all took time to think about how we were going to dress today and what we were, you know, and so that is the artist in all of us. So. This is, um, I think that also, Graciela, what you're saying is interesting in the sense that uh, from an artist place where I actually, um, I don't 
Sometimes I wish I could sign paperwork as an administrator to be taken seriously. Um, you know, in the sense where, what is really the role of artists? Am I falling into entertaining and decorating houses because I do art? Or can I be taken serious in city planning and development projects and actually become an architect of my city? Being an artist, I don't want to be an architect. I want to be an artist having this role. Um, so I think as long as we put out the work and the vision and the values of justice, we're not going to be taken seriously. I'm not taken seriously ever. You know, I mean, it's not to say that people don't respect the work, but it's I think because I've been there for such a long time. But it's not because I'm able to sign as a director. I think hopefully we all understand that as we continue to work for social, economic, environmental, and gender justice, and and you know destroy um, you know the world of you know greed and violence and capitalism and consumerism, that we do that successfully, we're not gonna. They're gonna make it a point to dis, you know to to dehumanize us, to devalue our words, you know, everything. I mean, San An as we talked about earlier, I mean, a few months, uh, last month, we were all having the struggle around Contemporary Art Month. In San Antonio, 65% are Latinos, right? And of those Latinos, the majority are Latina women. And they, you know, the Contemporary Art Month folks didn't have a problem not having any Latina artists. And then there was a follow-up conversation and there were no Latina artists on, on that panel. And that was really problematic. I don't know how, but you know, again, so who are they silencing more in this city is Latina women. And I wouldn't just say it's this town, you know, it's, it's throughout the world. But so here, and great that you bring the topic because then I wonder um, what is really the, um, is it, is it really possible to, to penetrate political change through art when you have relentlessly these situations of having an art exhibition, then you have a panel, and then continuously is the same, this, the, the same behavior, right, from whoever is organizing these. The community is reacting through an, through an exhibition. Is it an exhibition enough? to actually create the change, or at least begin it. Uh, and this goes actually to you who organized this exhibition. What is the follow-up? What happened afterwards? Um, to, maybe to answer the question about trying to bridge that work as an administrator and a work as an artist, I don't know. I think it's really difficult and I know it's something that I personally struggle with but I do find that they complement each other because my role as an artist I need to know certain things I need to know how to ask <coughs> myself I need to know what questions to ask and then my training or development as an administrator helps with that um, and so in in response or in reference to the exhibition you know, the exhibition came up it's still up there was a great response. There were articles written about it, um, but the conversation definitely needs to keep on happening. Um, I hope that people don't feel deflated and they don't, you know, it, it's sort of like this ebb and flow. And you know, we were up here, and now what, what's happening now um, with the exhibition? Kristen Gamas and I have decided that um, we are proposing to the artist to try and tour the exhibit. So we are trying to put together a catalog and we are trying to get it out on a national level. Um, we don't really know how to do that, but I think that we, between both of us, that we can try. And we can locate spaces and museums and, and cities where there are, where there is a need and where they may be wanting to so, show the space. So. Um, taking those steps to keep the conversation going. And what I think happened a lot with this conflict is a lot of people around me realized um, how they were being devalued and at the same time how much power they have. I think in San Antonio, the community here is extremely supportive 
I think that we're hungry, we want representation, we want to see ourselves, we are makers, we're creators, and if you do something, you're going to be supported. You're going to be helped out. It's very easy to find a space on your own in order to have a show. And this is something that I feel has been going on for generations in terms of the artists here, like they're doing it on their own. Um, and so by doing those things and realizing the power that you have in doing whatever you want on your own is a way to keep the conversation going. Um, and then maybe t taking a look at, at what's happening on a national le level, which NALAC does a great way of assisting us do that. Um, what is happening on a national level that is reflected in your local community and how can you insert yourself into that national conversation? Because I'll say more, but I want to. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, been, um, I've been thinking a little bit too, um, and what everybody is saying is extremely powerful. And I think um, change doesn't come just from one strategy, right? Um, um, and that's, that's something important to talk about because many times when we collaborate, um, there is a need to say, okay, y'all gotta do what I, what I, what I think is, is, is the real thing, right? Versus um, I'm doing my thing, you're doing your thing, you're doing your thing, you're doing your thing, and that's cool as long as we got a big goal, as long as we're, we got one vision um, of, how, of how and what our community looks like. And I think that's, that's the most important piece is that um, many times we, we fight over what strategy is correct, when in reality there's many, many strategies that are correct and okay and are gonna change our community. Um, and there isn't one, one that's, that's more important than the other. Being an architect isn't more important than being an artist. Just because I'm a directora, I never stop being a tia. I never stop being, being a, 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 a dancer. I, I never stop being an organizer, right? It's just, and just because I'm a directora does not mean that I got a, automatic power, right? I could sign, I could sign checks and, you know, like, like Graciela said, I could, you know, make the grants. But, but it doesn't mean that, that, that I, I have the power to change the world, right? Um, and I think that's, that's an understanding and that's extremely important when, when doing this work and having re representation at the city level is that we need to really think and step back and talk about um, what does it mean to have a solidarity economy? What does it mean to have environmental justice? What does it mean to have a living wage for both not only workers in the school but also artists? And what does that look like? So there's a lot of questions that, that we have, but there isn't enough conversation and coming together about how each of us is addressing this work and that it's okay to address it in different ways. And um, one of the things that Spare Parts is very aware of um, is the idea of uh, being rasquache um, and rasquachismo. Does everyone know what that, no? Okay, so it's, being, um, I've heard the, the simple definition of like Mexican or Chicano uh, ingenuity, but it's about um, creating the most from the least. So really working with what you have to make things happen. And so Spare Parts acknowledges the culture of being Rasquache in our culture and knowing that my grandmother still cleans out her plastic bags and hangs them on the clothesline to reuse them and that she cleans out her foil to reuse them and that's just a way of life um, to honor that, that the, the generations that um, because they had no choice but to do that and to bring that into um, the, the world of um, you know, programs and, and uh, more, more mainstream um, and listening to their stories you know, it's not only just creating and making and, and brainstorming with you, but hearing about the, 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 the five sisters who um, their moms couldn't afford for each of them to have a pair of white gloves to go to church every Saturday and look nice. So she only was able to buy several, you know, three pair, two pair, and they wore a glove on one hand and a white sock on the other. Um, hearing the stories of that, honoring our past, 
and and taking it to you know um, venues like this where they're not always here for um, to be a part of this conversation, but to know that that's extremely valuable and that's where we're coming from with, with what we do. Um, what I wanted to say five minutes ago, I don't know what I wanted to say because you all are saying great stuff. So, um, I guess one of the things that you did say something about, um, uh, Diana, about uh, having, a, a, there are many strategies, but just having that vision. And I do think, again, part of what I was trying to say earlier on is that we have to understand the, you know, the institutions of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, class, and all that sort of stuff sometimes limit us to have that same vision. So again, if we just, I mean, why did we strike out twice on having Latina women on, you know, in an exhibit and also in a, in a, in a forum, right? And I know because somebody told me that, like, some of our names came up to speak at that forum and we were X'd out. And we were X'd out not just by white people, but by people of color as well, right? because sometimes they don't want to hear some of our voices. Many times they don't want to hear our voices. So, you know, again, how does homophobia, transphobia, uh, feminist politics, visions, you know, make us disappear? Esperanza, you know, I worked at institutions that were civil rights organizations at Southwest Voter Registration at MALDEF. You know, men were in charge and the women were the secretaries. Men were, uh, 30 years ago, men were making 40,000 as directors and the women were making nine and $10,000. And they didn't have any uh, time insurance when they got pregnant until the husband of one of, you know, the wife of one of the men got pregnant. It's like, oh, maybe we should consider having uh, something for insurance for my wife, you know? <laughs> you know, so, uh, and again, nobody even talked about the queer issue. Right, and um, so, and, 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 it, and I'm not challenged by artists and, and, and other cultural spaces because they're not involved, you know, on the water issue. And, you know, we're concerned about what's going on in our communities, but when people can't pay their water because we've got this stupid pipeline that's coming down and it's gonna be at, on the backs of our people, why aren't we all out there demonstrating and speaking to our council members, you know? Silence, you know? It, so it, it's the challenge that, you know, on not just that issue, but so many issues that we only go before the council when it's affecting us specifically with our arts funding or something there, but not when we, that we should think in terms of the larger community rather than just. Yes, to bring it back to the, to the, to the topic of the talk, which I think what you're saying is incredibly valuable, but now I want to throw art in there. Because that's also the challenge of this conversation is art and social activism, which I think is incredibly conflicting, but at the same time, incredibly powerful in the sense that exactly what you're saying, you are not being, you are still not being invited to the panel. You weren't invited to the exhibition, no, you weren't also invited to the panel. I come back to this example as a, as a placeholder, as an example, right? But this only puts even more power to art, um, the role that art plays, because obviously if you are being excluded, then there is something very powerful about what is not being said. I think actually what is not being said is more powerful than what is being said, right, in this case. And I think about um, the political fear, the political sphere becoming aestheticized, and um, the politicians becoming so aware of the production of images, specifically with media coverage, for example, and then this also puts in this tension the position of art. Is art, again, decorating and aestheticizing politics, and actually this somewhat um, art loses power in this way? Or is it the other way around? Is it actually understanding art as this powerful communicative tool? so powerful that even Obama uses Shepard Ferry for his posters in yeah. his campaign. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that that can be, 
viewed in a couple of different ways. For instance, the work of Sanapa Cultural Arts, which is an organization that I mentioned earlier, right down the street. They have a legendary mural program. They have created, I believe, 48, 49 murals since um, it's been 20 years now, right? Since the organization started. And so the, the creation of those murals, and if we understand the history of murals and the power that they have to build up um, a community, it's, it's community building to preserve histories, to preserve stories, to tell the story of a people that is not being written down and may not be told otherwise. Um, and that is, that's a lot of power when it comes to combining art and politics. And then you have the other side of the coin where you mentioned where Obama is using Shepard Ferry in order to create his political campaign posters. And you even you think about the history of printmaking and you know printmaking was a way to create a, a large amount of material at a low cost. And the use of printmaking over time for political purposes. We have it here. We have, you know, an artist here that we love, Cruz Ortiz, that oftentimes makes um, political posters and it's, you know, there's, there's, there's a history there, right? And so I feel like it, it can be, I think I lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, let me, let me, add something on this mural topic before you move away, which actually has going back to some of the things that you mentioned, Graciela, in this commercialization and this capitalist way of looking at things. I've been living in Miami for the last 10 years. Wow. I don't know if any of you here have ever been to Miami, but there is this one neighborhood called Wynwood that has become hell because of murals. So in this one particular way, and um, the history of, of murals and how they tell stories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In this one precise neighborhood, through the process of placemaking, it has transformed um, as, as a neighborhood of the community into this tourist empty attraction that does nothing to anybody other than a thousand selfies being posted online with all these walls that are, they're just paintings that are decorating the walls. There is nothing else there. So here is that other side of the coin where I see wonderful organization that has been doing murals for 20 years. Meanwhile, you have another um, neighborhood that has put up, I think, four times more murals in only two years. Like, and commercializing, capitalizing on this idea of the history of the mural to take it to this other way place where it actually affects the way that we look at murals. I don't even stop at murals anymore. I lost interest. And maybe I am, you know, murals anywhere. I lost interest in general with murals because of this over of a neighborhood that now is completely fake. It's a, a, an attraction, a tourist trap. So I think that I, I, the, the purpose of art is uh, can be a whole conversation and a whole conference on its own for art for art's sake to art for political reasons for all sorts of ways that's a that's a tough question to answer i think but i think uh, one of our responsibilities is to teach visual literacy to people to be able to think critically about what they're seeing the messages that are coming from the things that we see and um what choices do we make when we see those images, whether it's to have to buy something or act or um, pass it on, but, um, but, but visual literacy and understanding how to read what's around us is so important um, in, in educational terms. Yeah, on that, on that, um, on that thought, um, I had the honor to take a class about a few months ago with a wonderful uh, professor, um, and he introduced to me the the, um, the um, uh, concept or term of visual activism, kind of like to merge these things that we're talking about of the power of the image and how, as artists, um, 
okay, there is all these movements and there is all these activists going on. How, as artists, we create an image, specifically understanding the role of technology that today is playing, that one image, I mean, already it is. It's enough said, right? Um, so, I don't know. I, and I guess, I mean, one has to be conscious of what all is going on. I mean, we have, I mean, you saw the fo photos from the Photo Historia project, which came out of just asking our community to tell their stories. I mean, again, this is this beautiful historic neighborhood, which still is stereotyped as, you know, the worst part of the town to live in, right? And it, but it's also still, after millions of dollars, if not more than that, billions of dollars spent in trying to fix up the neighborhood, it's still the poorest in the city. So when we did the Foto Historias, it was as we were just to gather oral histories and, and our women didn't speak. So it was like, bring your photos and they brought their photos and then, but they brought their husbands and their sons photos and it's like, bring your own photos. Anyway, long story short, the photos were, we put them up as a community museum, right? Not for anybody else, not for the tourists, it was for this community. And sure enough, it became something that, you know, the tourist community were like, let's come in. There's like, we don't want you here, <laughs> you know, leave us, you know, this is still for the community. We want to go and expand further in all the other directions. And and we start we saw how that was really quickly appropriated by the tourism council. So all of a sudden they highlighted the witty, the South School of Art, the McNay, and all in historical photos on St. Mary's and Commerce. And then all of a sudden I'm walking down market and then there are all these photos of people without names, without history, but you know, so they took them on, you know. But more importantly, what is exciting <coughs> for me is when the Chicago Elevarte is saying, we want to do that same thing, or Apple Lecha community working class folks, when they want to do it, it's like if they're appropriating it's not appropriate, it's like, let us share our ideas with you, as murals have become, but because it is about grounding our community and totally, and, and that's our problem when sometimes, you know, it's exciting, you know, to, to suddenly be recognized by, by these major institutions. So sometimes, yeah, you know, give us a million dollars and we'll let you have that image and we forget what it's doing to the larger community. And it's, and that whole idea of place, making versus place keeping has mm -hmm. been a struggle. So for us, it's like we, we're we nervous about all that gentrification. We know what's going on the east side and everywhere else. We're, so we want to build our community with all the actors involved and necessary that they decide what the future is. But, um, but we have to be conscious that everybody else is ready and um, to capitalize on it. Capitalize on it. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. So it would be nice to open up uh, to questions or thoughts if anybody in the audience has any. Hi, my name, hi, my name is Joey. I just wanted to make like a little assertion. It sounded like um, a lot of what, you know, when we talk about visual art and the commercialization of visual art, uh, one of the things that I've always seen really hard for Latino artists is that um, you know a lot of a lot of artists come from really hard backgrounds and are being told to get a job, get benefits, get a house, have some kids, all those kinds of things. And um, and then as activists and as artists, we tell them follow your dreams, do your art, and somewhere in between they have to make money, right? Somewhere in between there's like uh, the space from following your dreams and doing art, being an activist, to having to provide and have a family. And I noticed, um, you know, one of the things that's real hard for us to do is create a trajectory, both as an artist and as somebody that's a facilitator, so that people can feel empowered along that way to making things that don't end up becoming guerrilla advertising for Microsoft or for Apple or something like that, um, but become uh, something that's sustainable for them to empower their community while not gentrifying their community, to be able to come back to their community having been educated, having gone through these other experiences, but also being able to identify and respect where they came from in such a way as to foster uh, and help those communities um, have the things that they think they want. 
if that makes sense. Like the, the things that, that the community still wants. And that's something I've seen happen in small towns like Crystal City, Texas, and a lot of other small towns around Texas. And so I was just kind of wondering, you know, how do you all as facilitators and as artists uh, see yourselves um, kind of navigating those spaces? Because I know many of y'all, and I know y'all have to navigate them yourselves. You know, you have, you've had to find that line. So that was kind of my question. <coughs> I know sometimes in the art world, um, even arts institutions will take advantage of artists and say, can you give us artwork? You'll get great exposure. <laughs> so, so we're, um, away from that mic. Um, so as art institutions and arts administrators, we need to, 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 to give people living wages and, and honor their work and, and not make them volunteer for things so that they, be, they can support and give to their, their families so that it becomes not just the thing that they do at night um, on their kitchen table or on the weekends after they've worked all day, you know, all week long. That's unacceptable for cultural and arts institutions to expect the art, the art work, artist community to do things for free, um, to, to give them themselves for free. That, that doesn't pay the bills at all. And I know that um, with San Antonio SA 2020's initiative, the most recent data that came out is that we're actually losing arts and cultural jobs in San Antonio. Um, so it's a really serious issue. Um, and, and I know that our artists and, and, and folks like me would do it for free, but that, again, my, my passion does not pay my rent. And exposure doesn't pay it either. Heck no. And, in that, and, and also to, to to add something to to what I can't remember your name, Joey, Joey said. Um, also, the relationship between an art activism and, and the art market, yes, and also understanding that I don't know. In in the last uh, two or three years, I have been rambling uh, about this topic, and actually now I am in very much peace with the art market where before I was somewhat battling it because my objective wasn't necessarily to make money off of art, yet I need to pay rent. And I don't want to work uh, in a restaurant. I want to work in my studio. So understanding actually the importance of um, the inclusion of my artwork in the market, actually as an activist um, role. And if my work ends up in a public museum, because that's what museums are, right? That, that then ends up being um, an object that is representing a generation of today. So instead of patterning the art market and, oh no, the commercialization of objects is wrong, actually embrace it and understand that it's part of the, it's part of the run. And there's something very powerful about a museum acquiring your work. Well, but that's also a challenge. Like I remember one time this individual who had his first show at the Esperanza, you know, and just enjoyed that work, you know, it was, you know, it was coming up and it's like, you know, the museum wants my art piece and I'm gonna give it to them. And it's like, you're gonna give it to them? No, they should pay you for it. And it's like, what's the value of that piece? Oh, $10,000. It's like, okay, well, make them pay you $10,000 because if not, if you have that 10,000, maybe you should give it to the organizations like Esperanza, San Antos, Guadalupe, whatever, who are the places that you started with if you have that. But there's this big desire. So what is it that we need to do to also support those artists? I mean, people come into my house and they say, well, you have a museum. It's like, that's me personally buying art. And I have learned from artists that, you know, if it costs a $1,000, I don't have to have a thousand dollars. You know, I can set it aside for a hundred dollars a month over ten months, and then at the end of ten months, they give me the piece, and they, you know. But I've been paying up, and that's supporting. So how do we? Te that becomes also how do we say sustain our organizations? You become monthly donors because if we depend on those foundations, they're not going to fund us. So those are, you know, so part of the guerrilla warfare with our community is support 
those artists so we're not having to depend on these other it's the, you know we have a community that loves that works so consistency on the support but we need to do you know i lots of young people have come into the esperanza and it's like oh you know i remember um Vida Mia garcia who in 96 saw the first her first art show was Liliana Wilson fell in love and she learned about giving a hundred dollars a month. She is now a professor and <coughs> continues to buy Liliana's work. And Liliana knows that she comes to the Esperanza, she'll have, you know, she'll come up with $10,000 strong at the end of that because she has built up a community in San Antonio and that's all Latinas and Latinos. So we need to strengthen our community and teach them to buy the work of our own artists too. And in, a, and in addition to that, I think there is this this um, conversation or this ongoing kind of systemic assumption that, that, that has been put there intentionally that art is luxury, right? So, so when we, we talk to, to our workers, to our members, um, spending money on art isn't necessarily the, top, the, the first thing on their minds, right? Um, and, and I think that's how, that's, that's a part of the conversations that we need to have um, is sort of the value that artists and the value that that art piece holds um, and how we, we portray it with, with being proud and, and, and the dignity that's, that's, that comes with that, with that piece. Um, and I think that's, that's just something else that, that I wanted to throw out there is sort of the, the level of, of, of conversation and the budgets that, that our workers have, having poverty wages, having slave wages, um, it's, it's not the, the first thing, you know, Gra Graciela mentioned something around, around uh, water bills, right, and, and energy bills, right, and those continue to go up while our wages continue to stay the same, right, so I think that's, that's also the conversation in, say, in saying is how do we value and, and how do we create the space where, where um, art and artists and their work has, has intentional budgets and has, has that, that piece where then our workers feel that it's necessary and it's important part of their, their work and their lives and their, and their cultural representation to have, you know, earrings, uh, shout out to Sweetcraft, um, you know, have, have these, these d d different pieces in their life to support them and to strengthen and to root them to their community. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Laura Varela. I'm a filmmaker and a media artist and so, um, I wanted to get back to the point of exclusion in terms of CAM and uh, the response from the city. Um, first of all, uh, in terms of CAM, just the selection of certain curators and their view of contemporary art already excludes a whole slew of artists, from sculptors to media artists to filmmakers to to um, um, yeah ceramicists, ex expert ceramicists in the city, correct? And, um, and then so the response, we saw once again that they were excluding some of the experts at Latino art who are women, like Graciela and Maria, for example. I'm not sure why they didn't ask them to come up and speak, because that was one way that they could have kind of maybe at least given a lot of us that sort of hope that we have somebody speaking for us. So I would like to challenge all my colleagues here to please start attending the CAM meetings start attending all the city public art meeting, uh, PASA. I've been trying to keep, I'm gonna start going to the PASA meetings because I did try one time a long time ago to apply for a project and we didn't even get it uh, included. And uh, the person that got it was from Florida. And so once again, now they're doing the Elmendorf uh, Lake, that big public art project. And it's a $190,000 bond and it is a person from the Midwest. Once again, a man a white man, and I'm sure they're very qualified, but how do we get our artists to that point where they're considered uh, qualified enough to get those grants, if they're not even giving mid-sized or quarter-sized? And I also think that we have to work together to break down the systems of funding and who makes the decisions. We have to keep an eye on this game because if we don't know how to play that game, they're gonna keep going. So we're talking about breaking down institutions and systemic barriers for Latinos and people of color, right? Well, we better learn those systems very well. And one of those ways is by going to these meetings, by, for example, Roberto Trevino had, had an absent, uh, uh, a vacancy in his council, and I talked to him, and he's uh, designating a filmmaker, a man, which would be great, but I'm a filmmaker, and I happen to know there's no funding for media arts in the DCCD funding. The Film Commission has one grant for uh, a feature filmmaker, and then they have their neighborhood film projects. So that's how filmmakers can get funded through the city if you can. 
So I, I, I was thinking, wow, this is the most perfect time for him to have a Latina artist on that panel, and if we all write to him, maybe, you know what I mean? I mean, I don't know. These are just things that I would like to challenge everybody and talk to them about because I honestly feel that if we're not there at every single meeting reminding them that we're here, and hey, by the way, who's making the decision for that artist that there was three people eligible and who made that decision? And by the way, I have like three or four friends who tried to get on the PASA list because you have to be on a pre-approved list by PASA, right? You have to apply. They couldn't even get through and they are the most qualified people in the world. And so, you know, like if we're not watching this, Ivy Taylor has five appointees from her side on the public art, uh, the public art board. Each council person has one person. She has five and so in PASA, she has about four people representing. When I was there, they don't all show up, right? There was only five people on the board. So guess who's making those decisions? It's, you know, I guess Ivy Taylor and the, uh, and the people that they're assign assigning, the people that maybe that, that, that they want to get these contracts. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it happens, but of course they're, they're, they're appointing people on the board. So we have to let them know, we wanna be on these boards. We wanna be on these, private boards that you guys are, are hiring. I, they did the, they, they're doing it with the phone community as well. It's mostly men. It's just, it keeps happening, and I feel like I'm in between worlds. I'm not quite a visual artist, and I'm not a feature filmmaker. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm a media artist, and I don't fit in, in any of the structures of the city. I do fit in with private foundations, so I mean, I, I, I am an uh, alumni here with uh, NALAC, and I have received funding from them, which I'm very grateful for. But there's, we've got to talk to the city and say, we're tired of you guys giving hundreds of thousands to the Witty, to the Briscoe, to the McNay, to the Symphony, and not allowing small, mid-sized organizations to take that leap and grow. And we're tired of no individual grants for artists. Like we need these grants too, particularly women. I'm going to do a mapping project on all the public art projects. Me and my, my friend Lauren Browning, who's a sculptor, and she used to be a scientist. We're going to map all the public art projects, and we're going to see the gender, if they're Latinos, and are they from San Antonio? Because we need to know. You know what I mean? And when they did the mission. Of the River North artwork, they were all men and one woman, and that woman had been dead for like a hundred years or something like that. You know, and then they went south and it wasn't any better. We did, we did one where we mapped all the, 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 the public sculptures of people, and 95% are men and 5% are women, and they're all mothers. So this is just the of people, so not to mention the actual public art that's here in the city. Well, I think I have a more comments than questions, um, but I really want to speak because um, I'm an independent choreographer. I'm Fabio La Torre Alba. I um, am based here out of San Antonio. And um, I went from being or identifying solely as an activist, a cultural worker, and, or, and an organizer to now an artist um, and an activist that is really an organizer. So I don't fit into um, any of the worlds that I'm becoming a part of, which is the dance um, world, um, modern and contemporary dance, which is very elitist, very white-centered. If you're a choreographer and you're a woman, you're gonna have a lot of battles just in that realm. Um, I think that what I want to say to everybody that I learned recently this year, because I went on, um, a spree going to different auditions, um, trying to get myself into grad school, not because I wanted to become part of that world, but because I was seeing that really you need those papers in order to get any kind of credential, because even though you've been doing the work you've been doing for 10 years, um, you need those papers. And I know about papers because I'm an undocumented immigrant or was, so I know the importance of that. And one thing that I saw, like as one of the only Latina that was at these auditions, is that there are no Latinos in these spaces. Um, and, and it's important to keep that into perspective because I, coming from an organizing background and like being very like, why aren't you here, why aren't you here, why aren't you here, and why aren't you doing the work? But also being a working class person, like the first generation on both sides of the border to like have gone to school, graduated, and all of that, like have an accountability to my family that experiences financial crisis like every you know few months, you know, and has to deal with this reality of immigration that's very real to us still. Um, and so I have to take care of this family too. And I'm working on my feet, like at a restaurant, like because there isn't an industry in the city that supports dance. Um, 
I feel like we should be more compassionate towards each other. And because there are so few of us that are in these spaces or that are getting to become part of these spaces, we're still learning how to navigate in the system. We're still learning ourselves, like what is it that I need to do in order for me able to do my work? Like for instance, I'm like, oh, you can't just dance and have fun and play. You gotta become a choreographer if you want your stories to be there because nobody's gonna tell them for you. That means I have to like learn how to fundraise. That means I have to like write grants. That means I have to be a stage manager, a production manager. I have to do all wear all of these hats as an independent artist. And I think that sometimes when you're working at an office or your work as an artist is being subsidized by your partner, um, you don't have to think of like having to carry all those in that same with that same regard, with that same like level of of, of weightedness. So there are so few of us in these spaces. I feel like we need to listen to each other. We need to support each other. We need to use the power and the access that we do have. Because I do think that you've been, if you've been able to get yourself into some chair or sit at a table or through some door, you do have power. And I hold myself accountable to that all the time with whatever I have. And create capacity so that we get more people in there. So I just wanted to say that. Hello, I'm Andy Flores. I'm a writer and a teacher and an artist uh, from San Antonio, living in Austin. And I first of all wanted to thank you guys for all being badasses and blown away by all the work that you're doing. But I also had a question about the future of space making and specifically space making for uh, Latinx youth. Um, I heard recently, and I think it was in a play I just saw, that um, so much of the love that um, Latinx give out or work in is based out of or comes from this place of like anger um, of all the systems in place that are telling us we can't, we don't have the time and the space to feel that love. Um, so I, I know a lot of the stuff that was talked about on this stage today was um, how to build, uh, how to, instead of focusing on, I guess, anger as anger, instead of building these communities and empowering these communities to just create for them and letting them know that creating for them is enough and spaces specifically for them and not for other people is enough. And I'm, I'm personally in a state of uh, artistic development where it's hard to choose how to express this anger that I feel every day, just like as a Latina um, in this current uh, socioeconomic and cultural climate. Um, so I was wondering how you thought teaching youth or um, teaching youth how to explore that anger and that love what that's going to look like in the future? Are, are we teaching people to, you know, throw the middle finger to everyone, or are we solely focusing on um, building more spaces for us? So, yeah. Um, that's a great question, um, and I, and coming from a um, experience working with kids in CPS care for over 10 years um, who have been through really difficult times and it's not their fault um, and being angry in their, in their situation, um, offering them art is a very constructive way, <coughs> art classes is a very constructive way to take that anger and, and injustice that they've, they've um, endured um, and instead of um, hurting themselves negatively or um, doing something negative to others or to, um, you know, a life of crime because of, of their situation, we're offering them ways to express themselves in positive ways. And a lot of young people don't know those tools exist, and the only ways they know are to act out in anger and um, self-hurt. So um, what Spare Parts is, um, which I'm, I'm very proud of, is that we go in to these communities, this one specific community, for example, and teach them ways to utilize materials around them um, to learn how to dance, to learn how to um, write, and with those tools, they're able to be productive, and instead of being, again, harmful against 
themselves or others, they are using art as a tool to grow, um, to learn about themselves, and to make their community a better, a better place. I definitely have a lot of anger in me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it, our work that we do, and I, I grew up with around military contamination. That was one of my main projects at Southwest Workers Union, because I, I grew up on the south side um, between two military bases. Um, so I would go to these Air Force meetings, these uh, EPA meetings, um, and I'd leave crying. Right, as a as a 19 year old girl, um, the only you know woman in the in the, in the room um, who didn't have a degree, um, there was there was this immense sense of like you know your experience as a resident of this community is not valued, right? And I I think out of a lot of that anger came um, this realization that I, I also have a lot of love, a lot of love for the people around me, a lot of love for my community and this, this immense passion to, to change what I was, right? Um, and sort of the way, the way we see each other and the way we work with each other, and while we could, while we could stand in that, in that place of anger, there is also this reality that, that there is a place of love too, right? A love for yourself, a love for your panza, for your brown eyes, for your brown hair, um, and sort of finding that, that space and that place to, to to build that is is extremely important, um, and I think for me growing up was was um, I was scheduled to, to go into the Air Force actually um, because my teachers told me that was the only way I would be successful and get out of the the, the quote ghetto, and which was the South Side that I loved, um, and part of that that need was to create the space for young people to feel welcome, to feel okay, and to feel loved. Right for whoever they were and whatever choice they they made, right? But also, but also, given that that guidance is that we need guidance of our elders, we need guidance of our community, we need guidance from the people around us to know that that are the way that 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 we're going, the the actions that we do are actually we're accountable to our community, right? So I don't I, I don't make these decisions based off of you know. Diana Lopez from the South Side, right? These these the decisions and these conversations and 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 our work and our goals and our um, and sort of our vision come from our members, come from our community. And I think that's that's the important piece to to say is is how our work is influenced by by where we are, where we've been, and and where we're going. So so I I definitely agree that that you know. As a, as a young person growing up in San Antonio, there, there needs to be more social justice spaces um, where we talk about these, these, di these different issues outside of, of, of a system and of, uh, particularly for, for a young person, you know, their, their world we, we runs around school, right? That's where they spend the majority of their time, right? But to be able to, to say, um, you know, this is another space where you could hang out and talk and talk about these issues. Um, in a space that's that's supportive of young people, um, but that's grounded in in community, that's grounded in elders and identity and and roots and and history is is extremely important. So I definitely agree that that there needs to be more spaces, there needs to be more more places where where we're we're showing love, where we're we're talking about so, social justice in a way that's that's that builds towards towards creating power because that's what we're talking about right each each one of us in this room has power um right and it's and it's dignity and it's justice and it's li liberation where we see this this power come and it's through arts that that and through expression and through you know whatever ways and means that that we are that that's how we show it right and that's how we show love um or anger which is also an expression <laughs> Yeah, just remember, especially if you're talking about young people, there has never been so much violence in our world as there is right now. And it's going to be more so. So in my short life, I see it more and more. And again, so again, how do we create, 
How do we shift that culture of violence into that culture of love and compassion? And again, what moving away from individualism and, and greed and hate and war to one of love and compassion, <coughs> right? So we need to create we need to create. <laughs> so let us create those images. Let us let us remember. Let's work at intergenerationally, like our you know, and learn from the elders. Again, my mom always said, "Hacen bien y no te fijes en quién." Right? And she learned it from her mother and her, you know. So it's just just do for community, do for one another, um, and 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 those ideas and concepts of being bien educado. I mean, we've put, and I learned this in a conference where Tomás Ibarra Frausto was talking and he said, you know, in our community, in our culture, there's instrucción and then there's being bien educado. And what you learn at home is being bien educado, you know, con permiso, man, uh, you know, things that some people might say are derogatory as well, but it was like, you respect the elder, you respect the young people, you know, you treat each other respectfully and you do good, right? And that's being bien educado. And instrucción is like how much you get, you know, PhD, but it was more respected to be bien educado than the PhD. And now we have a lot of educated people, a lot of it, uh, people who are in positions of power who run our city and our county and our world, and they're not thinking about any of us. They have forgotten where they come from and what they're supposed to do. So let us continue to not, you know, to share those values, change, shift that culture. Um, and somebody, Grace Lee Boggs, is a, was just died at uh, last year at the age of 100, and she talks about building communities of compassion. And she talks about what Martin Luther King talked about, the beloved communities. So let us create those communities. And again, they don't have to be 501c3s. We just, and we don't have to have walls, you know, the, you know just take up the space. The, those spaces are ours and the city and the governments continue to keep us from them. Let's take them, just take them. Thank you everyone for joining us today in this wonderful conversation and we must continue with the programming of today. Wow. for us to continue to think about as the weekend progresses. Um, what does uh, Brother West say? Uh, love, no, justice is what love looks like in the social realm. And so I think that there's a lot to be said um, that during a discussion about art and social activism, that compassion, love, uh, were an integral part of that seamless conversation. And yeah, art and social activism, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, so one of the things I learned from this panel is um, always thinking about this question, is how do you move in subversive ways when you're in a position of power? And we all have some sort of power, right? And so I think you do it with intention, you intervene with difference, you embrace difference. I mean, there's nothing in our bodies that is the same. Um, and it makes this like instrument of magic work tirelessly sometimes. So if we can just uh, think about that as we move forward, please take a moment to meet somebody different, introduce yourself, introduce your work, um, ask questions. Uh, we get to do that by breaking bread together just momentarily. Um, it should be ready to go. Are we? Yes. And so please, um, you know, you can form a line and get something delicious to eat and then come right back in here, have some platicas. We've got a wonderful lineup with Conjunto Heritage Taller.